It's a carbon copy day in the City of Angels. The Santa Anas roll in like a warm whisper, bringing with them the faint perfume that's a fragile mixture of ocean mist, late night diners, and automobile exhaust. Consider a gentleman whose signature in the hotel guest registry reads Mr. Sam Mims, and whose trade is synthesizers, musical instruments that sing not from air chasing its tail through some metal tubing, or from a string dancing over a Spanish guitar, but from electrons racing headlong through wires and circuits. His arrival in this burg is not the beginning of this story, it's the ending. It's the delivery of a special package to a special client, the conclusion of a memorable adventure. It's the culmination of a journey that has been the living embodiment of the expression, dust to dust. This program is brought to you by Korg, makers of fine musical instruments, and by Kiwi Technics. Makers of fine upgrades for fine musical instruments. Here at Centaur, we live to bring old synthesizers back to life. We find vintage keyboards wherever we can, and our crew restores them back to their original splendor. We also supply parts to tens of thousands of customers all around the world so that they can restore and repair their own keyboards. At our shop in Texas, we have on hand parts for the synths used by pros from the 1960s all the way to today's brand new keyboards. Our inside and out knowledge has made us known as the Synth Wizards. Our part of this story begins years ago before most people had ever heard of coronavirus. Back when our shop was at a different location. Back when our head tech and my good friend Gerald was still alive. But the real story began decades before that even. All the way back to a time when gasoline first edged over the dollar per gallon mark. When John Lennon's life was stolen. And the post-it note arrived on the scene to change the office landscape forever. It was a time when keyboard designers were working hard to create affordable polyphonic synthesizers. We all know that the outcome was incredible. But in a few circumstances, had synth designers been able to read the future, it would have saved us a lot of trouble. Synthesizer history is littered with the rubble of things that seemed like a good idea at the time. If Moog had only known that the black sheeting used to keep dust out of the Rogue and MG1 slide pots would turn into a sticky, nasty goo several decades later. Or if Roland had known that the red glue used to secure key weights would start to drip into the keyboard guts after 10 years or so. Or that the epoxy coating on Juno 106 voice chips would start to turn conductive and cause notes to hang and distort and crackle. The fact is, it's hard to know how certain materials will hold up after decades of use. Those things that seemed like a good idea at the time are now well-known problems with certain synthesizers. But there's a silver lining. Because some of these problems are so common, the fixes are also becoming common, and we now have modern parts to take care of many of these problems from the past. In this episode of Synth Wizards, we'll take a look at how a small battery nearly took out an entire species of polysynths. Then we'll pull one of these synths back from the brink of disaster and make it even better than brand new. Some time ago, we resurrected a Yamaha CS80, a monstrous polyphonic synthesizer that rocked the world back in 1977. The CS80 could save a total of four user presets and it did this by means of four tiny banks of sliders hidden under a trap door. If you had a good sound dialed in on the front panel and you wanted to save it, you simply set one bank of the mini sliders to duplicate the front panel sliders. It was the best that could be done with analog technology. 
But others were experimenting with using digital circuits to remember the positions of analog controls. In 1976, Tom Oberheim released a polyphonic synthesizer programmer that would store and recall the program settings in an Oberheim 4-voice or 8-voice, giving the user eight instantly recallable sounds. And in a small workshop in Sunnyvale, California, a new instrument was being designed and built that would use a microprocessor to control every aspect of an analog polysynth. When Dave Smith and John Bowen released the Sequential Circuit's Prophet 5 in 1978, it gave instant access to 40 sound programs, 10 times that of the CS80, and new programs could be saved at the simple press of a button. The biggest thing technically on the Prophet 5 was using the microprocessor, which then used the non-volatile RAM battery backed up memory uh, to go with it. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't the first one to use memory, uh, but it was the first one to do the complete integration uh, with 100% control of the uh, analog synth. Smith used a microprocessor to read the settings of every knob on the front panel, then save that information to integrated circuit chips called RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory. When a musician's finger presses down on the right button, he is really instructing the computer to read the position of every potentiometer, convert it all into binary data, ones and zeros, and then write that data onto a RAM chip. In order for the RAM chip to remember that data, it needs to have power. Without power, all the electrons go home for the night, all the ones turn into zeros, and the chip goes blank. So these digital circuits weren't the only new things on the Prophet 5 and Oberheim 4 voice. Along with them came the onboard battery. And ever since then, almost every synthesizer has RAM, and every synth with RAM also has a small battery to keep the RAM happy while the synth is turned off. Synthesizer batteries are usually soldered to a circuit board, and because the RAM needs only a minuscule amount of current, a battery typically lasts for a decade or more before it needs replacing. For the most part, these are 3 volt lithium ion batteries, and when they drop off in voltage, you simply solder a new one in place. Or if your keyboard has a battery holder, you just slip a new one into the holder. Now, here's one of those developments that seemed like a good idea at the time. Instead of using a battery that would eventually lose its charge and need to be replaced, why not just use a rechargeable battery? The idea was that while the keyboard was turned on, the power from the wall could recharge the battery, and perhaps this way, it would never need replacing at all. Most general music keyboards used these rechargeable NICAD batteries, as did some early Roland gear, and so did the enormously popular Korg Poly 6 and its offspring, the Poly 61. What these manufacturers didn't anticipate, however, was what happens when these keyboards are stored for years without being powered on. Without any recharging, a NICAD battery eventually loses its charge completely, and then it begins losing its guts. A terribly corrosive chemical begins leaking out of the battery and starts eating away at the circuit boards it's mounted onto. The copper traces on the circuit board become a corrosion superhighway, and soon those traces are turning black with electronic cancer, and the components soldered to those traces start corroding away as well. The result is a terrible mess that essentially destroys the synthesizer. A Poly 6 or Poly 61 with battery damage will usually turn on, but it won't operate like it's supposed to. Show it to a repairman and he'll likely shake his head and say that the circuit board is destroyed and is not fixable. But that's a repairman who's not passionate about wonderful synthesizers like the Poly 6. This type of damage is repairable. It's just a matter of how much time and energy you're willing to devote to it. Or, as we'll see a little bit later, you can devote dollars instead of time and end up with a Poly 6 that works even better than new. 
While we're on the subject of batteries, let's address one question that gets asked so often on our forums and emails. My synth isn't working. Will replacing the battery fix it? I can answer that question with just two letters. With a couple of rare exceptions, the battery has absolutely nothing to do with whether the synth works or not. It has just one job, and that is to keep power to the RAM memory when the synth is turned off. While the keyboard is on, the battery serves no purpose at all. In fact, you could remove it completely and it wouldn't affect anything. Now, this doesn't apply, of course, to small keyboards that are powered by batteries instead of plugging into the wall. And the other exception is the few keyboards, most notably the Yamaha DX7, which get so completely scrambled when the program data is lost that they appear to be broken. But really, a fresh battery and a fresh program load is all that is needed to get a scrambled DX7 back into business. Repairing battery damaged circuit boards has got to be one of the most painstaking synth repair jobs I can think of. You have to test every trace on the PCB that is in the vicinity of the damage and make sure that electricity can flow from point A to point B. And on a densely packed board like the Poly 6, this requires a good magnifying glass, a diagram of the circuit board layout, and a heaping helping of patience. Wherever a trace is damaged, it has to be repaired, and on a damaged Poly 6, you'll almost certainly find multiple traces that need fixing. But that's not all. Components are likely to be damaged as well, so you'll probably be replacing one or more ICs, resistors, and so on. And after that, you're still not done. You'll need to replace the battery, of course, but after doing all the work to repair the damage from the previous battery, you're not going to want to go through that again. So replace that rechargeable battery with a lithium battery, but that requires a bit of modification to the circuit. In short, this isn't a job for the faint of heart. On the other hand, it's all fairly straightforward, and if you've got some soldering skills, a test meter, and a lot of free time, you can probably get it done. And if you don't have these things, there's a great solution too. You can purchase an upgraded replacement circuit board. Some time ago, on a trip to LA, the Synth Wizards team met up with King Gizmo, who, along with Easy Mike Simpson, makes up the production team known as the Dust Brothers. These are the guys responsible for producing the Beastie Boys' Paul's Boutique album, as well as music from Beck, Tenacious D, Linkin Park, Carlos Santana, and the Rolling Stones. They also created the music for Fight Club. King Gizmo has an amazing collection of synthesizers, stomp boxes, and studio effects, and we had a blast hanging out in his studio and seeing how excited he is about making music. His exuberance for his musical toys was definitely addicting. And then you're just like, you know, you really crazy expressive with it. It's this kind of violent attack that it does. And just really weird stuff going on. It's a very good yeah, yeah. By the time we left that night, we had a new synthesizer project on the books, building King Gizmo, a customized Korg Poly 6. We chatted about some possible directions for the keyboard, but in the end, Gizmo left it in our hands to come up with something cool. So we started thinking of ways to bring his personality into the new build. What could we do to make a Poly 6 match the happy-go-lucky, kooky, experimental personality of its new owner? We pondered some ideas on the drive back to Texas, but no mods or customizing were gonna happen until we had a working Poly 6. So the first step in this project was a visit to Centaur North, our rescue shelter for abused and abandoned synthesizers. We rounded up a rather motley crew of candidates and soon had a lineup at the headquarters where we could assess what we had and what we had to do. 
Not surprisingly, we found that all five Poly 6s were victims of aggravated battery. The condition of the CPU boards ranged from terrible to horrible, and two of them didn't even have the CPU boards. They were probably thrown out by someone who decided they were too far gone. That's disappointing because we would have fixed them, regardless of how bad they were. But it did give us an idea. There's a silver lining to the fact that so many Poly 6s suffer from the same problem. It created a viable market for a replacement CPU board. And a company in New Zealand has come to the rescue. Murray Hodge at Kiwi Technics has not only designed a replacement board, but while he was at it, he added a host of really cool features that make the Poly 6 do what it never did before. So while we will repair the three CPU boards we have, the Kiwi 6 board sounds like a perfect upgrade for our customized gizmo synth. So I contacted Kiwi Technics, and a new board was on the way. Sequential's Prophet 5 synth had taken the world by storm in the late 1970s. It was a five-voice polyphonic monster with two oscillators per voice, a great sounding filter, and unique polymod capabilities. But it would cost you $4,600, about the price of a compact car. Korg wanted to design a synthesizer that would compete with the Prophet 5 but at a much lower price. The Poly 6 was their answer. At a price of about $1,100, it had six voices, and while it only had a single oscillator per voice, it made up for that by adding excellent delay effects that gave chorusing, phasing, and what Korg called an ensemble effect. The Poly 6 was an instant success, and today, over 40 years later, they're still in great demand. The Poly 6 also featured a unison mode that could stack all six oscillators together, and an arpeggiator that could even arpeggiate chords using the hold mode. And, like the Prophet 5, the Poly 6 offered RAM memory that could store its 32 programs. RAM memory that required battery backup, of course. And it's that rechargeable battery that should be replaced as soon as possible on any working Poly 6. Centaur offers a kit to do this. The Poly 6 came at a time when Korg was emerging as a major player in the synthesizer market. The Mini Korg and MS-20 Monosense had unique aggressive sounds and were affordable and popular. And along with the Poly 6 came the Mono Poly, a four oscillator synth that could be played either polyphonically or as a very fat sounding mono synth. The Poly 6 soon gave way to the Poly 61 and then to Korg's hybrid DW6000 and DW8000 poly synths, which used digital waveforms run through analog filters and envelopes. The remarkable thing is that these keyboards weren't just a brief chapter in Korg's history. The synth world has recently rediscovered the beauty and power of analog synthesizers, and Korg once again has an amazing offering of analog goodness. The MS-20 and the Mini Korg are available again, not just as modern emulations, but as exact recreations using the original analog circuits. And those early polysynths have inspired an entire line of new analog polysynths, like the Minilog and the Prolog, that provide a thick analog sound with tons of program storage, responsive keybeds, and modern interfacing such as MIDI and USB. Those unique hybrid sounds of the DW synths are available again in Korg's ModWave, but now supercharged with features like an XY pad for real-time control of the sound, a built-in chaos modulator, and up to 32 voices instead of six or eight. The analog era of synthesizers is no longer behind us. We are truly living in it. We started work on our customized Poly 6 in 2019, and then COVID reared its ugly head. So the project stretched out over three years, spanned two Centaur locations, and sadly outlasted Gerald, who passed away in 2020 from heart disease. This was one of his last projects. 
We weren't yet sure what we wanted to make this custom Poly 6 do, but we were sure that we wanted to build a solid wood cabinet for it. Few Poly 6s have made it this long in life without the plastic veneer peeling off the pressed wood end panels, or without the corners of those panels getting smashed in. We weren't about to make a customized synthesizer for a high profile client and deliver it with ratty looking end panels. So Gerald and Carlos got a little outdoor crafts time. He said, you only give me the picture. I said, what the hell's wrong with you? I gotta get my little pack of cigarettes now. <laughs> Damn you. Because the bottom of the cabinet is plywood and has quite a lot of hardware mounted to it, we decided it was probably easiest to simply saw off the end panels and save and reuse the bottom panel. We made the cabinet out of walnut and Gerald first cut out the end panels slightly larger than they should be then clamped both panels together with one of the originals so that the new panels could be trimmed to the correct size and shape. We used walnut with a distinctive grain to give our custom Poly 6 the most unique look. Gerald worked the two end panels together to make sure they ended up exactly the same size. The same walnut was used for the long front piece underneath the keys, piecing two strips together at the correct angle, then sanding them to look like a single piece. We wanted to not only customize this Poly 6, but to also personalize it. So Shaylin created a King Gizmo logo that we could print onto vinyl, then apply to the front panel. We wanted it to match the color of the Korg lettering, which is actually a yellowish gray hue. So we printed a whole mess of them in slightly different tones, since what shows on the computer screen might not translate exactly when printed. Then we just picked the print that matched the best. Had we done this logo in white, it would have been much brighter and would have looked like a mismatched sticker. Instead, it's a cool design that should blend in with the original graphics. So we have our package from Kiwi Technics that has the uh, CPU board for the Poly 6 in here. So this is kind of exciting. Ooh, nice. There's the new uh, AC panel. It, uh, it replaces the fixed power cord with an IEC cable there and adds the ever important MIDI in and out. That's so cool. That is going to solve all our troubles. So that is going to mount right in there and replace the CPU board that got destroyed by batteries. So there's the Kiwi, uh, Kiwi Technics power supply board that replaces the Poly 6 board. So man, this thing is gonna be rocked out. Sweet. The first step to installing the Kiwi 6 kit is to remove the power switch and the power cord from the Poly 6. This involves desoldering several wires from the power supply board, and the only trick here is that the wires are fed through a hole in the solder lug, then wrapped around it, and then soldered. So just get it all melty hot, then use the tip of the iron to unwrap the wire from around the lug, then pull it loose. The nice new Kiwi power plate has a cutout for the switch. Just feed the wires through, then snap the switch into place and you can easily move the serial number plate to the new Kiwi panel as well. So on the Kiwi 6 board, once it's in place, it's just a matter of getting everything plugged in, and you'll notice the connectors are a different type from the originals, and so it can be just a little bit tricky to get the wiring harnesses on there, but they just uh, slip on just like that. There's also a flat ribbon cable from the MIDI connector, from the MIDI jacks. That plugs in on the corner. But the main thing with the Kiwi 6 installation is on the voice board, there's normally a CPU chip here. And we remove that, and instead we're gonna plug in this uh, flat ribbon connector. And 
just make sure that's lined up and press down and get it firmly seated. And that should be about it. With the Kiwi 6 board in place, the next step is to simply reinstall the keybed, which plugs into the voice board with a single connector. The keybed is secured to the bottom panel with five screws. The most challenging part of the Kiwi install comes next, and it's really not anything very tricky. You have to make a couple of minor modifications on the panel board of the Poly 6. This entails cutting a couple of traces on the circuit board, replacing a few jumpers with resistors, and soldering three jumper wires onto the panel board. This was also the time to go through the calibration procedure and make sure that our resurrected Poly 6 is playing perfectly in tune. So Carlos and Ron took on that task. All the information is in the original Korg service manual, but the Kiwi 6 manual provides a much clearer roadmap with notated illustrations and easier to understand instructions. If I were to play a three note chord twice, you'd hear the chord change. Do it alone. See how it keeps changing? It's because the voice is in, inside here. Each strip for a voice, all of these controls have to be adjusted so they all match. With our gizmo synth repaired and calibrated, we have a Poly 6 that is even better than new. The vulnerable parts have been replaced with robust new circuit boards from Kiwi, and those new boards add a pile of cool new features. The Kiwi 6 is just such a great tool for bringing these instruments back to life and really negating a lot of the negative effects of the corrosion. So one thing I really like about the Kiwi 6 is your ability to change the subdivisions of the arpeggiator. They're divided from the master clock and you can select it to either be from the internal clock or an external clock. Um, factory fresh setup is the internal clock. So what you do is you hold your arpeggiator and you'll notice it's moving kind of slow. Well, all I have to do is scroll through my different subdivisions. You'll notice you can get it going pretty fast. Some of these also include swing. And then if I wanted to, I could clock that from an external source. So to do that, kind of same deal. Go to the sub menu, select where you want it. Now, the Kiwi 6 is an intelligent design as far as it automatically saves any changes that you make as you do them and they'll be saved per patch. So you can have different arpeggiation settings for different patches, which I think is really cool. You can actually hold down, like let's say a chord, and you can arpeggiate that chord, which you, know, you also get additional LFO settings and just a ton of patch storage, more patch storage than, than I would probably know what to do with. Um, so with all that being said, you know, I think the Kiwi 6 is a really great product. If alone, just from the technical standpoint of saving time on having to do trace repair, sit there and troubleshoot every last individual component to get a working unit, you know, you can install this main board, install this power supply and have an instrument that's more or less ready to go. With the Kiwi 6 boards installed and the Poly 6 back to working as it should, now is the time to add some special Centaur touches. Some mods that will really take it to the next level. I've got two things in mind. Uh, two secret buttons on the bender panel, perhaps. One, I think we're going to call a break button, and it just discombobulates the audio. So imagine playing a chord and then pressing that button to the timing of the music or something and making the audio blip on and off as you do that. The other thing I want to do, which was really inspired by Gizmo's personality, is to install a panic button. Not a button that you push when there's panic, but a button you push when you want to create panic. So he's such a, uh, a fun guy and kind of kooky and just gets so into the toys he has and, and the, the crazy stuff they can do that I think having a button that you can push and making the sound just go wacky when you press that button would be really cool.
We are adding a very simple uh, guitar pedal style diode based uh, circuit to the outputs of the uh, Poly 6 to give it a little overdrive. I'm just trying out some different components to see which flavor works the best. It's all about going through and um, finding what is most musical and what you can kind of lose yourself in when you're playing. You know, you don't want it to be too jarring, you don't want it to be too subtle. So it's all about finding that, that magic uh, combo. thumbnail <laughs> this project has been three years in the making thanks COVID it didn't take us that long to do the keyboard but every time we would make plans to deliver it to Los Angeles to King Gizmo there'd be a new outbreak new travel restrictions whatever so it just kept getting pushed back Finally, we've done all the cosmetics, we've made plans to deliver it, everything should be safe and good to go. This is for King Gizmo. We wanted to make it special. We wanted to make it customized. We wanted to make it modded. So we did some extra stuff. Uh, the customizing stuff, you can see, we, we did a King Gizmo logo on it. Uh, we changed the knobs to the silver uh, TB303 type knobs. Uh, it gives it a neat look. Uh, we've got the uh, silver uh, pitch bin mod panel to kind of match the knobs and and then here's the goodies here that we've put in we've got uh, some switches over the panels uh, the middle toggle switch adds a neat distortion to the sound the switch over the um, pitch bin wheel is a cut switch so every time you press that it just cuts the audio out which makes it really cool to do uh, rhythmic things while you're sustaining a chord something like that and then the uh, switch over the mod wheel is the real juice that's what adds cross mod on three of the six voices which really makes it go crazy so that's our panic button i i tried to think well what could we do to make something just make the sound go crazy and the first concept was to make all six voices cross mod each other but that got a little too crazy so nick had the idea of doing every other voice to where if you're sustaining a chord or doing an arpeggio um, you still get some semblance of the normal sound but you also get some voices in there that are crazy and it just yeah it, it's a real cool effect so there it is it's a, a lot of a lot of neat upgrades and customizing and uh, it's something we're real proud of and hope King Gizmo will be also. Finally, after nearly three years of trying to get this keyboard finished and delivered, we're determined to get it to King Gizmo. COVID restrictions eased up, 
So we headed west. And it was like the Twilight Zone. Since we started with a dusty old synth and were taking it to one of the Dust Brothers, fate had to step in and dare us to drive through a crazy dust storm. It was our final challenge in this saga. Finally, we sat down in Los Angeles in King Gizmo's backyard with our hot rotted poly six. So, three years ago, we talked about doing a poly six for you. We're yes. finally back here around COVID. Hopefully, it's mostly behind us. So, I think it's morphing into oxygen, <laughs> is my hope. That's my optimistic hope and feeling that it's mutating like in Andromeda Strain, one of my favorite movies from the 70s, written by Michael. I was excited to show off our creation, and since he had given us free reign on what mods we would do, I was sure hoping that he'd like the finished product. We're gonna show you what we have. You did, it's, it's beautiful. It, we, wanted, we wanted to make it very gizmo looking, mm -hmm. so we changed the knobs. Oh, the knobs too, wow, oh, that oh. is super cool. Uh, the first thing, well, one, we built a a new cabinet for Oh my so gosh. This is solid. It's gorgeous. Handcrafted wood. Yeah. It's, uh, no it's way. not going to flake off veneer or. Damn. You know. And then we do a nice little king gift. I love it. It's so perfect. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, these have battery damage. It's the horrible yes. thing Yes. Yes. And it tears up the main board. Mm -hmm. And so a, a great way to get around that is we went to a company called Kiwi Technics and mm -hmm. got a new power supply in mm. their Kiwi 6. Sweet. I see Kiwi 6. Yeah. Sweet. And on the back, it's mm -hmm. got MIDI in and out, uh, which the yes. Power 6 didn't have. Yes. And then a lot more programs, mm -hmm. uh, some cool arpeggiator stuff. Wow. I love arpeggiators. Yeah. That's my favorite part. And once we got that all working, uh -huh. well, then we then we said, all right, what what is gonna really take this over the top and be cool for you? Uh huh. And so we we added these three switches here. The audio break button was right on target. I'm very into that. I was yeah. like, I built a thing like that back in the '80s when I was performing at at, at hip hop shows and clubs and things like that, and. Uh -huh. uh, wanted to do transforming because that was like the great thing that everyone was doing. Uh -huh. Took a little get, getting used to. So then the next thing we did, the, the little switch here, which we made it a tiny little switch because we don't want it to get too much in the way, uh -huh. but uh, it, it's a distortion. Oh. Uh, yeah, you got, without even asking, you've got some of my favorite things. We, we, Going. Tried to, we tried to guess what, <laughs> what King Gizmo was like. Wow. Mm -hmm. so. Very cool. And then the third switch, I thought, what would really capture King Gizmo's personality? Mm. And I thought, we need to make a panic button. Mm. Not a button that you press when there's panic, mm. but a button you press to create panic. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. And so, the so I explained the crazy cross-modulation scheme that we came up with to create audio panic. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. That's really cool. And, and you can do arpeggiators. Stuff. Yeah, that's what I was just thing thinking. Thing. Combining that with an arpeggiator would be really wild. Yeah, because then some of the voices go wacky. And yeah. Some don't, and Oh, I love. So it's I love that blow. kind of stuff. This is perfect. Yeah, yeah, I love that kind of random introduction all the time. It just helps helps to sort of do cool things fast. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes synthy stuff can be a bit. Um, it, it can be a bit like y you got to do math and you got to plan and you got to know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. I think that was the f most intimidating thing to me at first, with. Um, with synths like the, uh, you know, like a Moog where you have to actually create your voice yeah, as yeah. opposed to one with memory like this where yeah. it's like, oh, I like this voice and now I'm gonna change it a little. If you have something to start with and you can whack it out, then yeah. Yeah, that makes for a lot of fun. I and, like that. And unexpected stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like presets and then I like, like things that do random stuff yeah. as you're playing, especially if there's like, 
beat locked things that things can do. Yeah. You know, if they're doing like rhythmic or uh, yeah. delay oriented stuff, or even you know phase or filter stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty weird. Now that I was like, am I doing that? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay, I must hear every patch in eight. Yeah, that's really, this is a weird, I love eight. Oh, wait, eight, four. Oh, the PBS sound. They have that, they have this sound on the uh, Juno, like, 106, too. Yeah. That classic PBS sound. Yeah. You know, like, I do lots of stuff with synths, but I am not a trained keyboard player. I'm a trained trumpet player. But um, things like that, that, that create um, mood movement, and, yeah. and, and, and like, they're so helpful to me. Because it's a little, it's harder for me to do it uh, in real time with the, with the chord progression. And so the story came to a close. King Gizmo was happy with his custom synthesizer, and we bid him a fond farewell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And more fun to come, I hope. Yeah. Because I got a lot of keyboards. Oh, you do. I do have a lot of keyboards, and I don't even use them. We'll keep in touch. Except the ones you saw on the racks. Yeah. Those are the ones I use. We'll, we'll definitely keep in touch. Okay, cool. And, um, Make some great music with that gizmo. Absolutely. King gizmo the gizmodic uh, modulator. Right. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Take care. Have a great trip back. Bye-bye. We started off with a battery-damaged, dusty Korg Poly 6, and we resurrected it by installing the Kiwi Technics Kiwi 6 replacement CPU board and power supply. Then we did some customizing with a gorgeous walnut cabinet, a King Gizmo logo, and new knobs to make it a one-of-a-kind gizmo synth. But just making it look unique wasn't enough. We needed it to have unique features. So we added a brake button, a distortion switch, and a panic button, which cross-modulates three of the six voices. All told, King Gizmo ended up with a great-looking, great-sounding synth with some major mojo. Dust to dust, in the best way.